Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. And we are about chapter one. Chapter one we're down around verse, um, let's, let's pick up in verse 19, and then we'll go from there, okay? For it pleased the Father that in him shall all, the full, all fullness dwell. Now remember, part of the reason for the writing of the book of Colossians was dealing with Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a rampant doctrine. Uh, there's several things that Gnosticism was in, in error about. Actually, there may not be anything they were not in error about. So, <laughs> okay. But one of the things that they believed was that, you know, material was evil. So that the material didn't actually, God couldn't have created material things because it was evil. Thus God you know, wasn't involved in it. And then only spiritual things mattered. So it didn't matter kind of basically what you did with your body. Your body was irrelevant. Um, because it was material and evil, and, and, and then it also, they didn't believe Jesus came in the flesh. They didn't believe, uh, you know, that, that Jesus actually put on a flesh body because it was evil. Therefore, he couldn't, have, he couldn't have done that. So you got, you got a lot of things they taught. Another thing they taught was, oh, was, I didn't see. I, I, I see now it's a little girl. I'm sorry. I said he was looking at me. Hey, sweetie. Hey, darling. You like Pastor Ed, don't you? You bobblehead. Yeah. There you go. Um, but the word fullness comes from a Greek word that the Gnostics use to refer to intermarry, inter, intermarry, intermarry, I can't even get it out now. I messed it up. Okay. Intermediate beings, there you go, that were between earth and heaven, uh, and they were called the fullness. That Greek word is what the Gnostics called them. And Paul writes here and says that it pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell in Christ. So he just knocked their doctrine out the window. He, he was that fullness. Amen. Hallelujah. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by himself to reconcile, and remember being back, bring back into proper relationship all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Jesus came to bring all things back into proper relationship with the Father. Okay? And having made peace through the blood of his cross by himself, I'm sorry, um, verse 21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies... In your mind by wicked works, you, you, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Now, here's where people get in trouble. They'll take verse 21 and 22, chop it off, run off, that's it. That's all he's ever said about it. He's, he's going to present you, how? Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Next verse. If. You continue in the faith grounded and settled. Now, this is not works of the flesh. This is not the ability of humanity, but it, you do have to continue to live a faith life and a faith walk and live according to the gospel. Can you say amen? Somebody say amen. amen. Listen to this. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and... Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature uh, which is under heaven where have I, Paul, and made a minister. Now stop here. We've been reconciled. He's going to present us holy, unblameable, unremovable, unmovable in, in God's sight if you have to continue grounded and settled in the faith. You can't go out here and start living like every dog sinner on the planet and act like you're, you're going to get away with everything and say stupid stuff like, I'm under grace, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm still going to heaven when the Word of God says God wants to present you holy, un unmovable, unchangeable. Let me make sure I get these right, three, three things he said. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And it's like, if you continue. Now let me say this. The continuing to remain settled and grounded with God is an action of grace in your life that you're cooperating with. It still takes God working in you to establish it. You can't do it yourself, but you, you cooperate with the grace of God. The error is people saying it doesn't matter and they lay down and do whatever they want to do. They are no longer cooperating with the grace of God. They actually come contrawise with the grace of God because the grace of God leads you in a proper direction. When you start giving into your flesh, you're going contrary to it. What happens? You have now become unreconciled. You're no longer 
in harmony with God. Remember, he reconciled us, brought us back into harmony with God. When you start walking according to the flesh, you get out of harmony. And if you live there long enough, he won't be able to present you holy, unblameable, or unreprovable. Amen. So therefore, we do trust the grace of God to work in us, but we cooperate with us. Remember Paul said, if, uh, <clears throat> shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. People will run off of that part and go crazy with it, but they forget the next verse. Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul, God forbid. Why? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? In other words, and then he goes on, and, and we, we've covered this in Romans 6 and in Romans 8. He talks about not presenting your members as servants of unrighteousness. Amen? But to present them as servants of righteousness. Amen? We are to, and so we, we have a responsibility to cooperate with the grace of God. And it's not works. I, don't get, I just get fed up with people just jumping on a little word and misinterpreting a couple of scriptures and running out and teaching people all kind of stupid stuff. For me to do anything is a work, and I'm, I'm, I'm dead to works. I'm under grace. You need to study your Bible better. Hello. And you need to stop. I, I like systematic theology. I, I like studying subjects. Grace, faith, love, the Holy Spirit, the gifts. That's systematic theology when you're studying a, a Bible subject. And you go through all the Bible and you take verses that deal with that subject and you study that. That is a great, one, one of the ways to study the Bible. But you must balance systematic theology with exegetical theology and, and, syst and, um, and expository theology. You need to study the Bible in more than one way. In other words, it's good to study the whole so that when you study systematically, you get the balance so you don't get out and left field with something. So reading the whole book of Colossians, reading the whole book of Galatians, reading the whole New Testament, reading the Old Testament, and then studying, you know, studying those things in context, and then coming back and studying faith, there will be enough in you that when you go and, and want to go off the deep end, and say, no, 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 no. Now, when I was studying the, exegetically, you know, I found out, you know, there's other things, and, and you know, this, this, this systematic approach um, is great, but I'm not going to get swirled out by getting off the deep end with something. It's going to keep me in balance. Okay? Now, exegetical is to really go in there and study, you know, almost line by line, word by word, you know, doing an exegesis on things, studying what Greek meanings are, those things. It's good for you to do that. Now, children, immature or, or baby Christians, and I'm not using that in a, in immature in a negative way, when you're a baby Christian, we love the systematic. I gave $100 and I get a return. Well, glory to God. Amen? We don't like the exegesis at that point where we go in there and we find that the Bible teaches us about keeping our heart right, not becoming greedy or filthy lucre. You know, we just want the, as Randy Greer used to call it, when he was in prison, when they got contraband, they called them zoo-zoos and wham-whams. A lot of Christians, all they want is the zoo-zoos and the wham-whams from the Bible. They don't, want, they don't want the other stuff that helps grow you. Can somebody say, yeah, help me, Jesus? All right. So, he, he reconciled us in the body of his flesh through death to present us. He did that so he could present us holy. He, he could present us unblameable, unreprovable in the sight of God. But the responsibility now falls to the believer if we continue. This is not a one and done thing. Bobblehead with me here. Come on, come on. You know, well, I got saved and now it just doesn't matter. I'm under grace. I can do anything I want to and I'm still going to heaven. You know, you're foolish. That's just foolish. Number one, it shows a lack of love for the Father. It shows a lack of respect for the redemptive work of Jesus Christ who shed his blood to redeem you so you wouldn't go to hell, so he could present you holy, so he could present you unblameable, so that he could present you unreprovable un un in the sight of God. For you to take that, take advantage of that and say it doesn't matter what I do because I still get to go to heaven. That is a slap in the face of God as to what he did to redeem you from your destruction. And it just shows an absolute disregard 
for the heart of God. Oh, no, 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 no. God did all this for me. You know, yeah, yeah, he did it for you so that you could walk how he planned for you to walk. Not so you could do what you want to do. Amen. So grow up a little bit. Stop living on zoos and wham whams. Stop living so that, you know, and it's all about me and, you know, I can get away with this and I can get away with that and still get to heaven. Your life is a living epistle, the Bible says, known and read of all men. What does that mean? I, gotta li I need to live in a way that when other people look at me, they see Jesus Christ. Somebody, come on now. They don't see a Christian getting away with whatever he wants to get away with. He don't see you out at the bar drinking your, 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 your long neck Michelob after church and saying, well, we're free Christians. Come on now. Living in sin. Having swinger parties. You know, and then telling everybody, well, I'm a Christian. I'm still, I'm still going to heaven because I'm under grace. Isn't this great? Do you know the price paid? Remember, we're bought with a price. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed so it could be offered on the mercy seat of the throne of, before the throne of God in heaven so that you could be redeemed so that he could come and present you holy. He could present you unremovable and unblameable in the sight of God. But then he puts a stipulation on there if you continue. So don't come into the kingdom of God and then misuse. As a matter of fact, uh, hold your place here in Colossians chapter 1. Because this is, you know, we're about, we may not get past here tonight. Run over to Jude. Hey, Jude. I'm not going to sing any more of it because it's an English euphemism for heroin. Supposedly, okay, okay, suppo <laughs> he's going to defend the Beatles. <laughs> Let me find it right here. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy. Be unto you in peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, I will give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto you. Wait a second now. They're sanctified, called of God. What, what else are they? Preserved. He said, you've got to contend for the faith. Isn't that what he said? Right there. I'm right to you to get to, to, you got to contend for the faith. Now, I've heard people who are in some of this teach, crazy teaching say we need to get rid of uh, Jude and Peter and those guys because they didn't agree with Paul. Now they're going to start taking stuff out of the Bible because it doesn't line up with what they want to hear. You better watch that, pal. All right. Um. It was need for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should, he exhorts them, it, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord God Jesus Christ. I will put you therefore in remembrance through, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Angels that kept not their first estate left their habitation, reserved in chains until the judgment. What's he, he's giving examples here. Remember Egypt, Israel was delivered. They were brought out. And then they were, they turned. They turned. Now, notice what happened. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. It actually, that word means a licentiousness or wantonness. In other words, grace became the cover for doing whatever you wanted to do. That's, what, that's kind of what that word ends up meaning in this phrase here. They crept in and turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, licentiousness, wantonness. Think about that. They are warned. Why? Because when you take, 
As we said before, we talked about Paul's writings so often. We're talking about the life and teaching of Paul so much for the past year and a half. We started January of 2014. We're still going. Get a camera shot of the baby. Put it on camera. Hey there. All right. Paul would talk about who we are in Christ, and then he would turn right around and talk about the application of what we got, from, what we got in Christ. In other words, it's, it's an, it, we have to apply things in our life. The grace of God was never a cover over for all, doing anything you want to do. It was there to empower you to do what God called you to do. Amen? People have crept in, in the, here in the, in, back in the day of Jude and crept in and turned them into lasciviousness, wantonness. They, turned, they changed God's grace from what, an empowerment to do right to a cover to do wrong. Sounds like stuff going on today, doesn't it? I said, it sounds like stuff going on today, doesn't it? Why? Wow, ain't nothing new under the sun. Same devils are running around that ran around 2,000 years ago. They still run around with false devil doctrines. All right? Hallelujah. He goes on and says here, um, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and, and are set forth as an example of suffering for the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of, digni of, of dignities. Man, I'm telling you, Jude was blasting them, wasn't he? Now back over to Colossians. All right, we're not going to live there. <clears throat> so, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, to be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature. Now what? The gospel is not exclusive to a certain group. It's to all men. Amen? Uh, every creature which is under heaven, where I am Paul and made a minister. So what are we going to do? We're going to continue in the faith. Jesus paid the price to present Jeff holy, to present Jeff un, un, unmovable or unblameable, and he present him unreprovable before the Father. So what's Jeff going to do? He's going to continue steadfast in the faith. Amen? He's going to be grounded and settled. He's not going to be moved from the hope of the gospel. That's how he's going to have that happen for him. He's going to lay hold of what Jesus offered for him and did for him and, and grab a hold of that like a bulldog with a bone and never let it go. He's going to live right before God. Amen? And if he sins, he's going to repent and ask God to forgive him. Hallelujah. So he can go forward. Now, who now rejoice, as Paul now rejoice uh, uh, in my sufferings for you, fill up. That which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister. Paul's a minister. He's, he, man, I tell you, Paul had no problem declaring his position in Christ. Now, he did not declare himself some stupid stuff. I see people put stuff on the internet. That I mean the most honorable excellency of high point. And the queen of high point. His most honorable excellence. You know what? Get off that, 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 that ego trip. And get out of that man worship. If, the, if your people are doing that, get them out of man worship and you get off your ego trip. You're either, you're either uh, uh, there's five ministry gifts called the body of Christ, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Amen. And don't you go get lifted up about what they are. I'm, you know, uh, and, and, and his most excellency. His, I mean, it's like his royal highness. I don't even buy into that, that, the, that British monarchy mess either. The only reason the royals, they won the war and got the money. And the, the royal family of Saudi Arabia made themselves where They got a bunch of oil money and they started declaring themselves the royal family. I don't get into all that. But as Christians, we need to get out of this mess. Paul just, but he was strong about his, his ministry, his, about his authority as a minister. But don't you get into man worship? I'll get you doing stupid stuff. Like women in churches taking care of the pastor. They're called to take care of him, his, his needs. Yeah. I can tell you what happened to any woman in this church. You approach me like that, my wife will kill you. She'll tomahawk you to death. She's got one at home. All right, because she's Cherokee. All right. 
I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He has a mission. Do you know why ministers don't have the right to quit? Because they were given a mission by God to fulfill the word of God. No, you won't. There's times, I, 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 I would dare say there's every minister, every walk, has ever preached, has wanted to quit at some time. Wanted to give it up and throw in the towel and say, forget it. I, it's more fun just to go work at McDonald's and flip burgers. But we have a mission. We are called of God and in, 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 in the dispensation to fulfill the word of God. We have a responsibility to preach the word whether people like it or not. Amen. Amen. We will not compromise God's word to make us happy. All right. To fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from generations, but is now manifest to the saints. And we're, you know, um, you want to know what that mystery is? To whom God would make known that what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? Now remember, don't look, stop reading. It was a mystery hid from the Old Testament saints. It was a mystery held from the, the, the people that Jesus preached to during his ministry. It's been a mystery up until now. And then Paul's about to reveal it. What is the mystery? What is the mystery that's been hid? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Old Testament saints long for our day. You think, man, if I could have just lived when Elijah and Elisha, you know, and Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and all those guys lived and all the miracles that I mean, you know, Elijah that make an axe head swim and all this kind of stuff, splitting rivers wide open. One goes, it goes hither and it goes thither. Whoa, that'd been cool. No, no, no. They wanted our day. Are you here? I said they wanted our day. We, they were raising the dead. They were breathing on them. I mean, they were, they were having visions of heaven. Daniel was seeing all kinds of things. The angels coming out of heaven and talking to him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace. Woo, that would have been fun. <coughs> they all longed for our day. They longed to walk in the mystery that was hid until Christ was revealed and took our sin and became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. They all longed to live in the day that you and I live so that we could have Christ in us, our hope of glory. They live with Christ or the anointing on them. They couldn't have him in them. They weren't born again. No man was born again until Jesus was raised from the dead. I've heard some stupid stuff. I'm going to tell you, if, if nobody was born again before Jesus, then you're going to have to go repent to Abraham. Where was Abraham? He wasn't up in heaven. He was in Abraham's, Abraham's bosom was in the upper regions of, of Sheol. Or, I can't pronounce the stupid word, but anyway, it was, you know, the region of, of the departed was, was two, two chambers. Upper changer, Abraham's bosom, lower changer, the, 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 the place of suffering, hell. Abraham wasn't born again. Remember, you read your Bible, you find that Christ went and preached to the captives in prison. And then he led captivity captive. He let them out of there. <clears throat> he emptied out the upper chamber. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They had to believe on Jesus. I said they had to believe on Jesus. Glory to God. Are you here? And now, because he's, he's paid the price to come back, you know, and, and, they, and, and why stand you here looking up in heaven? This same Jesus will return again. Glory to God. And now Paul gets caught up into the third heaven. Oh, man. So they still didn't understand it. But I believe that when Paul was stoned and left for dead, most theologians believe this. When he was stoned and left for dead is when Paul had this thing happen. He says, I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I, I cannot tell. Such a man was called up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell. And her things unlawful to be uttered. In other words, he couldn't articulate what he saw. What did he see? He saw in the spirit for the first time what no man has seen, the new creation. They had heard Jesus say, you must be born again. They, heard, they, they, were, say, they were using the term sozo, that if you call the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. They, under, they, were, they were still having almost an Old Testament revelation of being saved. You know, in other words, you, you get to have a right relationship with the Father. 
But Paul came. And Paul said there's a mystery. There's a mystery that's been hid until now. And he said that mystery was hid from, from, from the Jews. And, he, and now the Gentiles are getting ready to get on it, in on it. And that mystery is this. You're not just covered. And you're not just saved for another day. Christ is in you. And that is your hope of glory. Paul saw the new creation man. And it took him the rest of his life to take what he saw when he was caught up into the third heaven and to articulate that in scripture and dissect it and write it so that we could understand it. Because he saw something nobody ever seen. Spirit beings that had been dead, lost, and alienated from God, reconciled to the Father through the new birth. He saw men who looked like the Christ they preached about. The same life was in them that was in, the, in, their, in their forerunner, Jesus. Now, Satan saw it on the day of Pentecost. When they all stumbled out of that upper room, he saw those men born again and saw Christ in them, but they didn't see it. We may have a hint. They may not have understood it because they said the, they appeared in them cloven tugs like as a fire and sat upon each of them. We may, that may have been the, 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 a slight exposing of the, in, the, the new birth man on the inside to all those people in that room. Well, what do you mean? Remember the, in the Mount of Transfiguration? When Jesus was on the mount? And, you know, and, and, and Peter, James, John went up and fell asleep. You know, they're, 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 they're the, uh, I'm glad they're not on my security team. I mean, and then, you know, and then they wake up, look up there, there's Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. And Jesus rained, it became glistening as a noonday sun. What happened? He just opened up his flesh a little bit and let the glory out. And it changed his clothes. Now they saw it in Jesus, but they hadn't seen it in a man yet. And they got Paul, Paul wrote, and he finally writes in this letter, and he says, here's the mystery, folks. Now, 14 years ago, I see that letter earlier he wrote, 14 years ago, I was caught up in the third heaven. I saw things I couldn't even talk about. Unlawful to be uttered. He just couldn't explain it. But here it is. Here's the mystery of what God said when Adam fell in the garden and the glory went out and Adam became uh, born again from life unto death. Satan became his spiritual father. Adam lost his estate with God <clears throat> and, and God had to clothe his naked flesh with, with animal skins and, and fig leaves and whatever they were covered up with at that time. And for the first time since the creation of man where he walked in the glory, a man saw what God said when he said, the seed of the woman will bruise your heel and you'll bruise his head. It'll take his authority. The prophecy of the virgin birth. Paul was called up into the third heaven and saw the new creation man. A man alive unto God. And clothed and although we're clothed in corruptible mortal flesh, the man on the inside is alive unto God and bears the image of the one he's born of. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Everybody say, Thank God for the glory. I say, Thank God for the glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Whom we preach. Who's that? Christ. Warning every man, the unsaved. Warning them, you must be born again. Teaching every man, telling the believer to grow up in Christ. In all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice, once to the sinner. He warns the sinner. They teach the believers. Why? So they can be presented mature, perfect in Christ. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to this working, which worketh in me mightily. Which worketh in him might. Thank God the working is, it's a different word. For, there's a couple of different words for power or working energy used here. Oh, Okay. 
Paul says, whereunto I also labor. This means agonizes. He agonized. Unto what? He was agonizing. Comes from the Greek agonia, uh, agona. Agona. And um, working comes from the Greek word, which we get our word energy. So he says he, 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 he agonizes according to this um, energia, energy, which worketh, this is, a, this is dunamis, supernatural power or ability. In him how? Mightily. Paul was agonizing to do what? To present them perfect with Christ in them, the hope of glory. I am telling you, church, if we could get people to once again see Christ in us, instead of trying to figure out how to get away with stuff, we'd be better off. And let that govern and control and rule in our life. It's not, hey, man, I go to a church, man, they tell me I can do whatever I want to and still go to heaven as long as I just say, Jesus is my Lord. I got saved last week. And you know what I went I, I, I've been shooting up all week to celebrate. Because I'm going to heaven no matter what. Got me three girls, and we, we just had us, a, we had us a sexual escapade just so I could celebrate that I'm going to heaven no matter what. You missed the whole point. God did not send Jesus so you could get away. He sent Jesus to empower you to live above. And Paul is now revealed to the church. Christ is in us. That's why terms sinner saved by grace don't work. Now, you want to, that is sin consciousness. I'm just no sinner saved by grace. That was how that, that old Southern Gospel group did it, Nathan Jim, real deep, deep, deep. I'm just a sinner. Huh? It's on the video, but it was one of those other groups that sang that. Live here anymore. And then he sings, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know, one minute he's talking about Calvary, I don't live here anymore. Next minute he's just an old sinner saved by grace. Which one is it? Well, thanks to Calvary, I don't live here anymore. Christ liveth in me. Amen? What did he say? I, you know, it's no longer I that liveth. It's Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. I'm no longer the old man. There's a new man on the inside. And that new man, when he is allowed to rise up, wants to do right, wants to serve God, wants to please God, wants to demonstrate the recreative work and the power of God working in them so that he honors God with everything he does and says. Amen. Stop looking for ways to dishonor God. That's not the heart of a man or a woman who has Christ in them, the hope of glory. Now I'll come right back and balance that out with this. If you do sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. If you'll confess him, he's faithful and just. And see, the heart of the man with Christ in them, the hope of glory, that if they do sin, they want to get that right with God and get rid of it. That is the true heart. So stop listening to the other stuff. <clears throat> you are setting yourself up for failure. I said you're setting yourself up for failure. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Man, I'll tell you what, if you just become inner conscious, we need to become Christ in us, the hope of Christ in us conscious. We call it righteousness conscious a lot. Let's just change it to this. Christ in us consciousness. The second person of the Godhead. The one whose blood was shed to purchase us. Glory to God. To establish us. It'll change things you do say and all kinds of stuff. You could be conscious of the greater one in you, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. It'll change. Instead of having somebody tell you, don't feel condemned that you just went out, you know, and, and had sex with four women. And, and this week you went to church on Sunday and found four different women to have sex with this week. Don't feel condemned. You're under grace. And you don't even need to repent. I'll guarantee if you become Christ in you, the uh, conscious, you wouldn't have made it to two without being condemned in your own heart. 
you wouldn't have made it through number one without feeling that. You had to water it down with something. Usually, maybe your stogie and your, and your bourbon that you're now so free to do. I need, I need a sound thing up here that I can press that gives me holy grunts and ouches and old me's and that kind of stuff. Because you ain't doing nothing out there. Oh, my. Christ is in us. Say, Christ is in me. Become aware of that. See, by telling people that they need to, you know, be continuing and be steadfast, you're, you're making them sin conscious. No, 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 no. I want you to become conscious of the one on the inside of you who paid the price so you don't have to live in sin, so that you don't have to be defeated, so that you don't have to go under, that you rise up, you're a winner, you're the head and not the tail above, only not beneath. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of that? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.